Hey everyone, welcome back to another year of the Triple Play. This is Danielle. I am back once again as the host for the Tennessee Journalist Sports Podcast. And this year we have a whole new slate of students coming in to take part in the show. So today we have Jake and Matt joining us for their first week. So Jake, would you like to start off? Um, yeah, how's it going guys? I am a freshman sports journalism major here at the University of Tennessee. Um, I've really enjoyed my time here so far, just really getting to know everybody and uh, in four years, I really hope to take this and be a sports writer. What you see with Clay Travis, Paul Feinbaum, um, maybe a minor version of one of those, and even make it to the big time if possible. Cool. And Matt? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a sophomore here at UT. Um, going into my second semester of journalism, hoping to go into sports broadcasting, hoping to get into some sort of field like that. Don't know exactly too much what I want to do yet, but... Just hoping to do something like that. I'm really looking forward to this. Solid. Well, we're really happy to have you guys on the show. And so we're just going to go ahead and dive into the news that nobody really wants to talk about after such a hyped week, and then it just kind of crashes. Uh, the Vols lost to Oklahoma in double overtime, 31-24. to um, If you're keeping up with AP rankings, the Vols are now out of the AP rankings. It was a nice week we had up there. Nice, nice little run. Yeah. yeah, nice little run. I mean, yeah. we went up two spots. That's yeah. good. Yeah. But then just dropped back. So it's fine. But like I said, 31 to 24 loss for the Vols. They did have a 17 to 3 lead going into the half, but then the Sooners made a fourth quarter comeback. A lot of people are saying it could be because of the lack of good play calling, the lack of smart um, officiating calls. These are all things that I've heard from different fans, different sources, but um, whatever you want to say about it, it was a comeback for the Sooners, and it was an impressive one at that. The ball struck first in overtime with an eight-yard touchdown run from Jalen Hurd, but then OU responded with a touchdown to send it to second overtime with the Sooners scoring first there. UT tried to answer, and Dobbs was intercepted by Zach Sanchez to seal it for the Sooners. So, I mean, looking at the stats, it was pretty evenly compared, you could say. Dobbs did have one touchdown. He did throw an interception with 125 yards, and he was sacked three times, while Baker Mayfield was sacked twice for the Sooners, going 13 and 39 for 187 yards with three touchdowns and two interceptions. But I mean, I know I've, I've heard a lot of people blaming it with like Dobbs and like not getting to the right receivers. But I mean, if you look at like Josh Smith, he had the most receptions on the game. I want to say he had four. Um, and it's good to see him coming back up to get those numbers. But what's your guys' take on the the unfortunate loss? I mean, um, I think we looked really good for the mm -hmm. first three quarters. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's just our defense there in the last quarter mm -hmm. just got winded, and they started taking advantage of that. Yeah. Um, Jalen Reeves-Maven, he looked really good. He had 21 tackles, mm -hmm. uh, one sack. He's uh, I saw a stat earlier where he's – in the top five in the nation in tackles right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Reeves may have had a great game. Um, obviously, you know, just a very hard loss. But I think um, one call that a lot of people are questioning right now is when we elected to kick a field goal on that fourth and one and did not just go for it. I mean, I understand the whole thing about uh, Butch wanting to, you know, uh, keep momentum on our side and, you know, from – uh, coach's perspective, I can see where you would want to do that. But at the same time, just from a fan's perspective, from somebody sitting in the student section during that game, I think that pinning Oklahoma back against their own goal line would honestly have been a better move. I mean, like I said, obviously not a D1 coach here, but at the same time, you know, a score right there would have given us like plenty of big momentum going into the next possession. So. I definitely agree with that. And going to other plays that are kind of being questioned, whenever you get down to the end of the game and you have around 30 seconds left and two timeouts, and then you just decide to just take a knee and let yeah, the clock I, run yeah, out. Yeah, that was, oh, uh, did not agree with that. No. I, no. I mean, you could hear the booing everywhere in the mm -hmm. stadium for that one. I mean, like, just, I mean, took what, two knees? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's two shots at the end zone, if not a field goal. I mean, exactly. Come on, you know. Definitely. I mean, that that was just really tough to um, think about. I mean, things are going so smoothly, and then you have, like, that little bit of momentum, and you could yeah. really capitalize on it and just take a knee. It's just, like, why? Yeah. It's just mm -hmm. a big question of why. But one thing that was really exciting to look at, especially in the first half, the O-line 
Like, yeah. Yeah. we actually Absolutely. had an O-line. Right. We haven't had that in a while. I mean, last year we'd see bits of, um, like, they, excitement they and momentum. But... at the end of the season. Exactly. Yeah. You can see, you know, sparks of hope going into the season, I right. think, for sure. But, definitely. Yeah. They definitely looked strong. They were making... Um, any stops they needed to, any tackles they needed with some big blocks. Um, I remember looking over at my friend at one point and I was like, wow, is this what it's like to have an O-line again? I've missed this. This yeah. is nice. But um, that was uh, one really strong high point for the Vols. But this loss did snap the Vols' 20-game win streak in home openers at Neyland. And like I said, it did uh, make them drop from uh, number 23 in the rankings out of the rankings. But looking over at the Sooners, they moved up three spots from 19 to 16. And so next week, um, the Vols will be taking on Western Carolina Catamounts, Catamounts, excuse me, um, here at Neyland. Um, Western Carolina beat Mars Hill to open the season last week with a score of 42 to 14, but they lost to the Citad to the Citadel Saturday, excuse me, um, 28 to 10. So right now they're currently fourth in the Southern League Conference. And looking over at the Vols, I want to say they're towards the bottom of the uh, SEC East. Um, we'll get more into the standings later with the SEC because it's a little. It's a little weird right now. Right I mean, now. it is the yeah, second. It's the second week. We'll give them that, but it's, it's just, just yeah. yeah. There's some yeah. weird teams up there, like teams yeah. that are making yeah. me shake my head a little bit. <laughs> but Western Carolina and UT will play Saturday at seven o'clock, and that game is scheduled to be on ESPNU. So looking over at the SEC, like I said, the rankings are quite interesting right now. But looking at the AP uh, AP rankings, because we've been talking about that, the SEC now has seven teams in the AP. Alabama's at number two. Georgia seven. LSU is at 13, Ole Miss 15, Texas A&M 17, Auburn 18, and Missouri rounding it out at 22. Arkansas, Tennessee, and Mississippi State all dropped out of the rankings this week. But right now in the SEC, um, the SEC East, I'm just going to go ahead and throw this out there. Kentucky is tied for first in the SEC East. Who would have... Thunk it. Yeah, definitely not There's, something yeah, to be expected. No. I remember during uh, the game, a guy that was sitting behind me, he kind of laughed and said, why in the world is Kentucky beating South Carolina right now? I mean, <laughs> nobody really thought that they were going to have the rushing potential that they have this year. I mean, there have been, like, talks about it in the offseason, but Stoops could be up to something with this team. Yeah, I mean, it's not the most popular viewpoint, especially here in Tennessee, but Kentucky is a really good team. Absolutely. I mean, last year they started out 5-1 and one mm -hmm. before losing six straight to not make a bowl, but they uh, they had some really good games last year. They beat South Carolina last year. Uh, mm -hmm. took Florida to three overtimes. Uh, ended up losing that game, but right. yeah, they're, they're a really solid team. They, they could, are. They could make a little bit of noise in the East. Maybe they not this year, but... Mm -hmm. Definitely here in a couple years. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. with a coach like Stoops, I mean, like you said, strong start last year before dropping the last six. But I mean, if they can keep up that momentum this season after beating, you know, a team coached by Steve Spurrier, I would say that mm -hmm. late this season that the Vols need to maybe watch their backs as we, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, play Kentucky at the end of every season. I mean, obviously, recently, uh, when <clears throat> Dooley was uh, here, you know, we dropped that one to Kentucky after, what was it, 24 straight? 20-something. 20, 20 I know it was 2011. It was a lot. It was, it was, several, it was 20 too many. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, um, but I mean, obviously, regaining that uh, win streak with Butch, but still needing to watch out at the end of this year. Definitely, and like you already said, um, Kentucky and South, like we've already mentioned, Kentucky and South Carolina, uh, Kentucky to get the win 26 to 22. And South Carolina, you have to give them credit. They put up incredible stats, 417 total um, offensive yards. But I mean, looking over at Kentucky's numbers too, they were just as impressive. Patrick Tolles, I really want to commend him for this game. Yes, he threw an interception, but he was 21 for 29 with 192 yards. I never thought that stat line would be possible for Tolles ever. I mean, he's a good quarterback, but 192 yards for him, that's very impressive. And looking over at rushing, like we've already mentioned, 38 carries for Kentucky with five indi individuals getting touches during the game, running for 207 yards and three touchdowns. Stanley Williams was one of them with 14 carries, rushing for 107 yards. And I'm going to go ahead and throw out that he's a name to watch out for this season. I mean, I kept up with some of their um, practices going into like summer and then um, early fall training and whatnot. But Williams has definitely been one that I've been impressed with. So I think he's definitely one to um, watch out for for Kentucky. I'm looking over at other interleague matchups that happened yesterday in the SEC, Georgia and Vandy, or I'm sorry, on uh, Saturday, Georgia and Vandy 
Uh, Georgia mm-hmm. won 31 to 14. Nick Chubb had one had 189 yards with 19 carries, but I don't think anybody's really surprised by that stat line. You're mm-hmm. used to seeing that from him. Yeah, mm-hmm. Nick Chubb. I mean, obviously a great running back. We saw that last year. I'm going to see that again this year, I'm sure. Um, but <clears throat> one thing I thought that was really interesting that I read earlier today was the comment that without Chubb, Georgia's offense would have been just a neat nick on Saturday against Vanderbilt. Uh, Grayson Lambert, the starter for them, had, what was it, went 11 for 21. Uh, then mm-hmm. I think his first completion was in the third quarter. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, for the Bulldogs, obviously, not something that you want to uh, continue going into the rest of the season. Even, I mean, against a team like Vanderbilt, you know, SEC defense, mm-hmm. but still after last year with Derek Mason, I think that they really need to take a step back and evaluate their offense after that performance. Yeah, going off that, like, if they didn't have uh, Nick Chubb in there, Johnny McCrary for uh, Vanderbilt threw for 295 yards, mm-hmm. completed 24 of 50. Not not the greatest completion stats, but still almost 300 yards. That's that's, that's really impressive. Yeah, I mean, uh, just, I mean, <laughs> man, wow. Uh, <laughs> I mean, whenever I was looking at that stat line, too, and I saw 295, I, like, I had to refresh the page. I'm like, this is wrong. <laughs> I, no. I thought Georgia was yeah. going to go up there and oh, blow yeah. them out of the water. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I think that's what everyone thought. I mean, mm-hmm. the spread was, like, what, 20-something. 20 so, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was a definitely a close game. They are closer than most people were expecting. Closer than it should have been. Yeah. I absolutely. Mean, they really uh, capitalized on the second half, too, because, I mean, they got off to a slow mm-hmm. start. And, I mean, after... The first half, when I heard about the scores before the UT game, just waiting around, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I was really surprised that it was that close. They really must have done some work there in the second half. Definitely. Um, and looking over at the other interleague game that ha- or interleague uh, game that happened on Saturday, LSU beat Mississippi State twenty-one to nineteen. <clears throat> another s- oh, close game. I was not that. really expecting to see there, mm-hmm. but Dak Prescott threw for three hundred and thirty-five yards and a touchdown. For the Bulldogs, and then Leonard Fournette uh, for LSU, 28 carries with 159 yards and three touchdowns. 335 yards for Prescott is really impressive, but I can't really tell if I was expecting more out of him or less. I mean, he had a touchdown. Maybe a few more could have been predicted for him, but, I mean, 335 yards is still really impressive. Being yeah. Dak Prescott and the dual-threat quarterback he is, I think yeah. I kind of expected a little less. Mm-hmm. So the 335 is that's really impressive for him. Right. Yeah, I would say um, overall, just like a recap from the SEC on Saturday. Obviously, we're looking in depth at State and LSU right now, but don't ever under mes- underestimate, excuse me, the power of a home advantage. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, uh, UT Oklahoma break the decibel record at Neyland Stadium, and then with the cowbell at Mississippi State, just the absolute effect that that had mm-hmm. on LSU. You know, close game, end of regulation, Mississippi State, fifty-two yard field goal mm-hmm. with three seconds left. That's right. And, and, I mean, he missed it. Les called a timeout right before the field goal, which, bad mistake there. And then missed it again. LSU got lucky. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They escaped a good one there. Definitely. And, es- and speaking of escaping a good one, Auburn and Jacksonville State. Oh, oh man. man. Wow. Oh, wow. Um, first of all, great game for the Gamecocks. I mean, I was not expecting this much from Jacksonville State. That was no, no, no. incredible. I don't, no. I don't think anybody was. They no. Beat, they beat Ole Miss a few years ago. That they? is true. Mm-hmm. Yes, I do remember that much. But I mean, for Auburn to only win by a touchdown in overtime, in overtime yeah. to Jacksonville State. Ugh. Just to reiterate that, Jacksonville State, that's incredible. And Auburn's number six right now. Um, I want to say they're still at number six. No, uh, they, they dropped. They dropped. That's right. Yeah. Goals. Oh, yeah. They went down to 18. They dropped yeah. 12 spots. That's right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that's insane. They were number six during that game. That's what I was uh, going at. But, I mean, seven points there. That's ridiculous. Uh, Ole Miss and Fresno State. Ole Miss just blew them out of the water, 73 oh. to 21. Uh, Middle Tennessee lost to Alabama, 37 to 10. Arkansas yeah, that's lost when I wanted to Toledo, to. 16 to 12. Yeah, that was in Little Rock. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, you know. Playing in Little Rock for them, I've heard, is kind of like what playing at Nissan Stadium was for Tennessee. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, they do that every season. You know, playing right. at Nissan was new for the balls. But, I mean, for Arkansas, to, oh, man, to lose to Toledo, I mean, you know, so much hype in the preseason. You know, UT Oklahoma, we played them well, mm-hmm. but then lost last minute. Right. Arkansas, after, you know, I mean, 
who's their quarterback, Brandon Allen, mm-hmm. getting a lot of hype in the preseason, especially from Arkansas fans. To lose like that, just big-time loss for Brett Bielema. Definitely. And looking at other games in the SEC, just to round out um, league play, uh, Texas A&M beat Ball State 56-23. to mm-hmm. Missouri beat Arkansas State 27-20, to another close one there. But, I mean, Missouri was 21 uh, in the nation at that point. Uh, Florida beat East Carolina 31-24. to I thought that would not oh, be man. that close for uh, the Gators. But mm-hmm. um, that's the rest of the scores for the SEC. So looking over at just college football in general, some – Crazy endings uh, and just scores in general. Uh, BYU. Yeah, yeah. Um, who thought the they Hail could Mary be a miracle and team? Then, I mean, come that is, on. That is just insane. Yeah. To have it is. Two, two Hail Marys back to back yeah. weeks from your backup quarterback. Mm-hmm. Like, nobody could have even thumped that up. Definitely yeah. not. And I mean, I'm, I've always been like a big fan of uh, Boise State, just mm-hmm. everything about yeah. them since the Kellen Moore days. And I was like, oh, this is going to be an easy one for Boise State. It's fine. Shouldn't question the Mormons. They know what they're doing over there. <laughs> I've heard true. that from so many people. That's they're like, true. well, now we uh, maybe there is like a Book of Mormon. Maybe it's a playbook <laughs> yeah. and not just like a stage show. And I'm go. like, okay, yeah, yeah Mormon sure. Miracle. We'll go with that. Yeah, Mormon Miracle. There's so many things right now um, to be calling them. But I mean, that's – I just – I don't really think anybody expected BYU to play like no. they have been. Mm-hmm. Uh, looking over at some other games, Utah and Utah State had a pretty close one, 24 to 14 there with Utah getting the win. Florida State beat South Florida 34 to 14. Uh, Clemson and Appalachian State 41 to 10 there. I thought Abbey State would um, put up a few more points on the board. I was kind of looking for them to have about 18 or so. But, um, I mean, for them to lose by 31 to Clemson, that's uh, pretty impressive for Clemson. Georgia Tech beat Tulane 65 to 10. Notre Dame and Virginia, that was a close one there. Uh, Notre Dame getting out with the win 34 to 27. TCU beat Stephen F. Austin 70 to 7. That's an incredible uh, differential there. Uh, Hawaii and Ohio State. Ohio State won 38 to nothing there. But Ohio State is no longer the unanimous number one in the AP polls because I believe um, Michigan State got two votes. Wow. Michigan State did get two. So that's yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. Right, 31 to 28 there um, for Michigan State. That's absolutely incredible. I know I had a lot of friends uh, texting me saying, oh, Oregon's got this one in the bag. This is going to be good for them. But, I mean, Oregon's just been so up and down lately. You don't really know what to expect. Mm-hmm. Uh, just another score to look at. Um, Baylor beat Lamar 66-31. to That's pretty much the kind of score you'd expect from Baylor. A very strong team there. But still, Boise State and BYU, that's the highlight score that's been jumping out at me all weekend. I think that was the, the, the most surprising yeah. Absolutely. game of this week. Oh, it definitely is. And I'm pretty sure Boise State got knocked out um, mm-hmm. of the rankings too, which is unfortunate. It's always good to see Boise State up there, but, I mean, give credit to BYU. They're now 2-0 and on the season. And they're and, also ranked number 19 in the poll. Exactly, so, which is to Took over, insane. what was it? Uh, I think it was, like, Oklahoma's spot when mm-hmm. they played. Yeah. Exactly. Like, yeah, 19. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So, I mean, a lot of crazy things going on in college football, but, I mean, it's only the second week, and it's already happening like this. There's mm-hmm. a lot to look forward to especially in SEC play, which will be coming up very soon. But now we're going to go ahead and take a look over at the NFL. The regular season has kicked off, kicked off Thursday with the Steelers taking on the Patriots mm. out of deflate gate <laughs> and everything else that was going on. And now there's headset gate, as if we need more gates in the NFL right now. Yeah. Um, but the Patriots got the win over the Steelers 28-21. to And like I said, uh, headset gate, the newest gate brought to you by NFL Films. We can make a documentary about all of these gates. But um, so the Steelers were saying that in the first half, their um, headsets had the the Patriots radio broadcast. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's a lot of talk with that going on. The Packers have said that they also had the exact same issue um, during the uh, preseason. But at this point, it's like, what can you believe right. with all of this? It's just like a new scandal every day it's for just the NFL. So much stuff. Oh yeah, yeah just. So much to get through. I mean, eventually you have to just look through it and say, just can we please play football? Exactly. Right. Um, I know going into the game, I, I, I'm, of course, a Steelers fan. And uh, I was talking to my mom during the pregame and my cousin who's in Pittsburgh. And she said, can we just, like, not have Brady on the TV for two <laughs> minutes and actually, like, look at, like, what the Steelers are going to bring? Like, what's going to happen for this whole season for other teams? But it was just Patriots, Patriots, Patriots the whole day. But, I mean... 
whenever you have a scandal that lasts literally like six and a half months, I guess that's kind of expected. But <clears throat> looking at gameplay, uh, Tom Brady threw four touchdowns. Absolutely incredible. Three of those went to Rob Gronkowski, which I think pretty much everybody expected. Um, <clears throat> I know before the show we were talking about how Gronk should have had more touchdowns. Um, he had some extra looks that could have went his way. But, um, yeah, you said they had one channel on a crossing route. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, that's still an impressive win for the Patriots. I did not think that the Steelers were going to throw to Antonio Brown towards the uh, corner of the end zone at the end of the game like they did. But I guess that's kind of expected with last-minute touchdowns for the Steelers. But looking at other games that have happened, yesterday the Titans defeated the Buccaneers 42-14. to <laughs> Marcus Mariota, welcome to the NFL. Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought it was kind of funny. It was Marcus Mariota against Jameis Winston. And the last time um, we saw a football game between these two, Marcus Mariota came out with the win then yeah. as well. But Mariota... Much better than Jameis, too. Yeah, oh, Jameis. Absolutely. First NFL pass, pick six right off the bat. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, two former Heisman winners facing off against each yeah. other. Mariota obviously mm -hmm. just proclaimed himself Definitely. as a present in the NFL right off the bat. Just mm -hmm. great performance. Definitely. I mean, he was 13 for 16 with 209 yards, four touchdowns, and no interceptions. And then Winston... Kind of lackluster for the most part. 16 for 33, 210 yards, two touchdowns, but he did throw two interceptions. Mariota definitely looks like he could fit into an offensive, or an NFL offense, I should say. And I know a lot of people were saying that he wouldn't be able to um, going into the season. I was definitely one of them. I was kind of skeptical about what he could bring uh, to the Titans because I know this Titans team is one that has struggled for a while um, trying to find a quarterback that can yeah, really lead them. Absolutely. So I think it's good for the Titans that they have him. He could definitely be become a force to be reckoned with, maybe. Um, it's tough to tell after the first game. But, yeah. I mean, four touchdowns in your like, opening game in the NFL, that's pretty exciting. That, that's yeah. really impressive. I definitely. That, um, you know, obviously with Mariota as the new quarterback, but then with uh, you know Doriel Green Beckham on the outside mm -hmm. and then obviously Justin Hunter. Being from UT, I Definitely. think the Titans could really have an explosive offense this year, and that's something that people really need to look for. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting. I mean, the AFC always produces a lot of um, exciting games and some big stats, so I mean, maybe they'll be able to contribute to that too. But looking over at another game in the AFC, the Broncos beat the Ravens 19-3. to you want to say good things about Peyton, but this was not the best performance no. I've seen from him. Their, their defense definitely won that game for him. Oh, yeah. I mean, defenses were strong for both teams. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, that's where the scoring came, and the game was from both mm -hmm. defenses. They both scored touchdowns, but Peyton was 24 for 40 for 175 yards, no touchdowns with one interception, but Joe Flacco was just as lackluster as Peyton. Um, 18 for 32 with 117 yards, no touchdowns, and two interceptions there. And rushing was really slow, too. Baltimore rushed for 73 yards on 23 carries, while Denver rushed for 69 yards on 25 carries. I mean, this isn't really the kind of stat lines you'd expect to see from, a, like, these two types of teams. I mean, you know they both have strong defenses, Baltimore having the stronger of the two just within past years. But I expected a lot more out of the offense for the Broncos. Mm -hmm. It was definitely lackluster. But looking at some other games that happened, um, I mean, why not start off the uh, first game or the regular season, I should say, with a big rivalry between the Packers and Bears. That's just exciting. Yeah. And it was an exciting game at that. 31-23 to 23 with the Packers getting the win. Uh, looking over at more games, the Chiefs beat the Texans 27-20, to 20, and it was Eric Berry's first game back um, for a regular season start, which was so exciting. Good to see him back out there. The Jets beat the Browns 31-10. to 10. Bills Menzel's first NFL touchdown. Right. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. My phone was going ballistic whenever he scored but he was 13 for 24 on the day with 182 yards and one touchdown like we just mentioned yeah, so really really up and down game yeah. he, he had Absolutely. some really good moments but he also had some not so good ones i feel like that kind of sums up the cleveland browns yeah. though yeah i mean yeah, that's sure. that's the perfect yeah. summary that was mm -hmm. nice but uh looking over at some other games the bills beat the colts 27 to 14 andrew luck threw for two touchdowns in that game with 243 yards so pretty Impressive start there from him. Uh, the Dolphins beat the Redskins in a close one, 17-10. Ryan Tannehill only threw for one touchdown for the Dolphins. Kind of expected another one from him. I mean, there's been a lot of hype around him going into the season, but we'll see what can happen. It's still really early on. Panthers beat the Jaguars 20-9. Seahawks lost to the Rams 34-3. to Or 31, I'm sorry. 34-31. to 
in overtime with the Rams getting a field goal to um, seal that win. Uh, the Cardinals beat the Saints 31-19. to Chargers beat the Lions 33-28. to uh, Bengals and Raiders, this was a really interesting game. Uh, Bengals won 33-13, to like I said. Andy Dalton had two touchdowns. I was not expecting him to throw for double touchdowns. I mean, Andy Dalton's a good quarterback, but I wasn't really expecting that from him. But then again, he was playing the Raiders. Exactly. Yeah, so you got to give him a, a little something. Exactly. Yeah, Absolutely. You got to take the opposing defense into account every time. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, Absolutely. You know, Dalton, I mean, coming from a team that, you know, put up, what was it, 70 mm -hmm. this weekend? I mean. Right. And then uh, the most exciting game of yesterday, I think we could go ahead and give it that uh, preface, the Cowboys and Giants. Oh, yeah. Cowboys win it. 27 to 26. Romo. Tony Romo absolute, can be clutch? Just, yeah. Question mark? <laughs> right? Like, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> yeah. you know, like reading on, uh, like, even like on Facebook and Twitter this weekend from friends, I've got one that's a really big uh, Cowboys fan early in the game, you know, just uh, dissing Romo, just going off. Mm -hmm. And then at the very end, about, like, you know, just scrolling through my newsfeed, I see something about Tony Romo being a rock star. Like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. Like, Tony. Like, Romo for president, what are you talking about? But, I mean, he <laughs> saved the game. Yeah. It does he help did. when your running mate is Jason Witten. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. I was going to say, I think that's why it's so exciting for all of us, the fact that Jason Witten got the winning catch. I mean, yeah. that's so exciting for him. Um, yeah, he's coming up on 1,000 catches. Yeah, he's coming Yeah, he's coming up really close on that. I don't know what how close he is, but he's fairly close to it. I want to say he's got a, around 940. Wow. Something like that, yeah. Somewhere yeah, he's there. really close. He could break the thousand probably like halfway through the season I'd say oh, yeah. if things go his way but Monday night football tonight we're gonna have a double header going on the Eagles and Falcons will kick it off um, on ESPN at 655 and then the Vikings and 49ers will play at 1015 also on ESPN those should definitely be really exciting games especially that Eagles Falcons game I've been eyeing that all weekend so that could be really exciting and then looking over at baseball super quick we're not going to go too in depth with it there's only 20 days left in the season, so if you're as big of a baseball fan as I am, you're really sad about it. October 4th will be the last day of the regular season before we start to get into playoffs. Um, playoff talk is already starting, though. Cardinals are still on top with a record of 89-54. and 54. But the Pirates, and yes, I'm saying the Pirates, are two and a half games back in second place. I was not expecting to say that by the beginning of the season, so this is great. Um, but they are two and a half games back right now, and if they somehow beat the Cardinals in the NL Central, it'll be the first time that they've won the division since 1992. <clears throat> they've made it into the playoffs the past two years and have turned out to be a really surprising team um, so far, so that's really exciting. But speaking of surprises, if we look in the top five um, teams right now overall for the MLB, you'll find the Cardinals, the Pirates, the Royals, the Dodgers, and the Cubs. Chicago Cubs are fifth right now in the MLB, which is so exciting. But I mean, yeah. whenever you look at players that they've had come up, like Chris Bryant, who I know I talked in depth about um, last year during the show. Uh, Chris Bryant, Kyle Schwarber moved up from the Tennessee Smokies. That's the AA affiliate here in East Tennessee. Uh, he moved up, I want to say June 17th, he went up to um, the Cubs, and he's been very impressive for them. You have, like, Anthony Rizzo. Like, those three players specifically, they have been insane. Then you have John Lester pitching, and he's been solid for them coming over uh, from Boston. But three teams in the top five are from the NL Central, so that's a really good showing for the NL, NL Central. But looking over at the wild card play um, right now, the Yankees and Rangers um, are at the top for the American League, and then the Pirates and Cubs are at the top of the NL. But what's really surprising is the Braves. The Atlanta Braves are 27 games back in the NL for the wild card race. And right now they're tied for last in the NL East with the Phillies. I don't really think, I mean, I know there's been a lot of things going on with the Braves this year. Um, hasn't been the year that fans have been wanting. Uh, trades were happening at the beginning of the season that kind of just rattled everybody's brains. But, I mean, for them to be 56 and 88 right now going into 20 games left, that's... That's not very good. No, it's not no, good. No. Especially from a Braves team who, I mean, their fans will... They'll tell you what you think. Oh, yeah. They will oh, speak yeah. their mind no matter what. I mean, even getting, what was it, beat by the Mets back three the other night. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Wait, that was Tuesday, what, 14th? That was, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was last night. Yeah, night. just last yeah. night. Mm -hmm. Right. But, I mean, it's it's been crazy. I know last night, uh, to put the 
Pirates at two and a half games back. They had a walk-off win in the 11th inning. Um, Josh Harrison hit that walk-off there. I want to say it was a walk-off. Uh, might have been a walk-off home run. I don't remember. I didn't get to look at it, but I know it was a walk-off. Um, but, I mean, the Pirates are surprising. If they could somehow take over for the top of the MLB right now, I mean, that would be insane. I'm not just saying that because I'm a Pirates fan. I'm saying that because, I mean, as a baseball fan in general, to see teams like that who have struggled for 20 years to, like, come up and, like, be like this strong that's mm-hmm. impressive mm-hmm. <clears throat> but like I said there's only 20 games left in the MLB season so there's still a lot I want to say a lot to look forward to but with 20 games you don't really know what to expect we'll just see if there's a new top uh top dog in the MLB yeah, but the Cubs can hold it down and really the Pirates too that's true the NL Central right now is definitely as always the division to beat in the MLB but That'll stay exciting for the next 20 days. We'll see what happens. But once we get down to um, closer to October, we'll talk more about um, playoff strategies and everything for teams. But that's all we have for today. A pretty big show with uh, football and baseball talk. But join us next week as we really start to get in-depth with Tennessee football. And we will be one week closer to SEC play starting up for the Vols. And that'll be really exciting. But thank you for joining us this week. And we will see you next week.